Today on Your Money, it's a stock market 101. Class is in session, and I'm demystifying the market. A look at index investing, plus tools to help you buy and sell. It's all coming up next. Hello and welcome to Your Money. I'm your host, Gordon Severson. The stock market has been in the news a lot recently, hitting new highs and making people a lot of money. But what is the stock market and how does it work? I'll sit down with an expert to break it down. But before I get into what the stock market is doing today, let's have a history lesson. When most people think of the market, the crash of 1929 comes to mind, and it makes sense. Almost 100 years later, this event is still considered one of the worst economic events in U.S. history. I fired up our time machine to travel back to the fall of 1929. Take a look. The New York Stock Exchange was in a turmoil. For four days, despite efforts of multimillionaire financiers, Zucky Morgan, frantic investors had scrambled to unload their securities at any price. The panic had started four days before and was now grinding to its tragic finale. Everyone wanted to sell, no one wanted to buy. Stock prices plummeted down at a fantastic rate. Suddenly, even the most secure gilt-edged securities were practically valueless. In the last hour of that Black Tuesday, almost three million shares flooded the market. The inevitable crash had finally come. How had it happened? America had been enjoying prosperity almost unequaled in its history. And yet, there was the startling headline that meant the end of an era. 20s, personified by the flashing feet of a line of flappers executing the Charleston. They seemed to tap out the cry, forget your troubles and live for today. And that's exactly what we've done. Following the closing days of World War I, we had lived as if there were truly no tomorrow. Everyone had money to spend, and if you ran short, there was always that wonderful thing the brokers called marginal credit. And if a few voices cried out a warning, they had to be talking through their hats. Industry was booming. Prosperity was here to stay. Everybody had money for everything. It was a mark of honor to drop a bundle at the races. And besides, you might run into Al Capone, something you could brag about later in the speakeasies. These were the golden years, shouted America. Life was just a bowl of cherries. Who cared whether the stock exchange had extended itself too far with eight and a half billion dollars worth of credit buying? We had more important things to think about. Would Jack Dempsey successfully defend his title? Would the Yankees take the series? Where would Lindbergh fly next? And then in 1929, somebody rocked the boat, and the flimsy house of cards of our prosperity collapsed. $50 billion went down the drain in the market crash. Rich men reduced to paupers overnight committed suicide. Industry ground to a halt. Real estate and business assets were worthless now. The man with a dollar bill was king, but he was awfully hard to find in the millions of unemployed. The bottom had dropped out of the market, and on its heels was to come the most bitter depression the world has ever known. It happened on Wall Street in 1929, and before it was done, the whole world was to feel the impact of the suffering and privation brought on by the blind and futile panic of the stock market crash that shattered the economy of the world. On Black Monday, October 28, 1929, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 13%. The following day, it dropped again, another 12%. Just imagine the panic that must have caused. Retirement and investing accounts dropping by 25% in just two days. In the weeks that followed, the Dow lost almost half of its value. Imagine half of your retirement account wiped out. And get this, the Dow didn't recover that lost value until November of 1954, a whopping 25 years later. Economists learned some important lessons in the crash, and while today the markets do go up and down, we thankfully haven't seen a crash like that ever since. The stock market can feel very intimidating and scary at times. All the numbers, terms, and money moving around, but it doesn't need to be. Here are the basics when it comes to picking the right stock for your portfolio. First, find a publicly traded company. There are thousands to choose from. Second, figure out how this company makes money. What do they make? What do they sell? Then take a look at the annual report. 
research their outlook and plans for the future. Then decide if you want to be an owner of this company. If you like what you see and you're willing to put some money down, open up a brokerage account or buy a few shares of the stock using your retirement account. Then watch the company to see how your stock performs. I sat down with an expert to get her advice on how to get started. These days, there is just so much information out there about the stock market. Is it up today? Is it down today? Which stocks are doing well? Which ones are not doing well? But today, we're going to focus on the basics of the stock market. And to help us kind of give you a crash course of the stock market, I have uh, Professor Julie Guerin from the University of St. Thomas, who uh, teaches courses in finance and investing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on the show today. You're very welcome. Pleasure so, to be here. <laughs> so at the beginning with the stock market, mm -hmm. what, what exactly is the stock market? What is some of the basics of what's what's involved in there uh, well the stock market in basic terms is an ability to invest in stocks and ask yourself do I want to own this company um, when you go to the bank and put money in the bank and perhaps maybe allow the bank to do a CD you're giving them your money and it may earn an interest rate in the case of the stock market, um, it's active investing in companies and you become owners you are an owner of the company and I guess at the very basic, uh, really laser focusing on it is you're buying a piece of a company and Correct. if the company gets bigger, your piece gets bigger. <laughs> yes, well, and particularly if it goes up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you want the concept of buy stocks low, you know, sell them high. So the, if they appreciate, if they go up in value, you get to participate in that. When it comes to evaluating which stock is right for you and which one is a good investment, I, I, there's so many statistics and data points out there. It's mm -hmm. kind of like Major League Baseball. Yeah. There's so many different <laughs> little ways to measure. Yeah. Is this player good? Is this stock good? Is there certain thing, or certain measurements that people should look at or focus on um, and maybe help them ignore some of the other noise that are a little bit more nitty gritty that they don't need to necessarily pay attention well, to? Well, there is a lot of noise <laughs> and there is a lot of data. And there's even a major at the University of St. Thomas called data analytics, uh, business analytics, um, because it's you have to harness some of that data and in the industry that's what a lot of these investment professionals do trying to get an edge right try to understand a company's inner workings and then investing in that company if they if it shows positive signs correct um, but uh, in terms of data I would say keep it simple is the company making money um, that can be found right on their uh, income statements their financial statements that as a publicly traded company they have to provide what, what is the benefit of a company going public and deciding to put their company out on the stock market? Why, why would they even want to do that? It's access to capital. At some point, the company can no longer just simply be taking loans to fund their growth. And so accessing more capital, uh, like investors, you or I, or the general public, um, is a, the big benefit. It's much easier to access capital when you're a publicly traded company that they need our money to grow yes. and then they're mm -hmm. going to give us the benefit of yes. owning part of the company. Correct, correct. And you participate in it when you're an owner of that company by purchasing a share of stock or multiple shares of stock. For sure. And we can't talk about the stock market and investing in general without talking about risk and reward. What are correct. the risks of investing in a stock in a company? Well, to make, keep it really simple, you are owning a share of that company and that share can go up or it can go down. And um, so looking for positive, optimistic outlooks for a company and that kind of sector too, because sometimes a company can be a really good company, but can be in a sector that is just not a good place to be due to the economy, due to other you know headwinds that they just can't control. Uh, but again, taking a look at that company and understanding the specifics of, you know, again their value proposition their product or service and whether or not um, that's something that's going to grow because if it grows that's positive if it doesn't grow the market doesn't like that too much and that becomes kind of a, a value company um, undervalued to s some people might argue like the management team um, but ultimately if it's not growing and the share price is not increasing then you could be losing value in your original investment and obviously with the stock, with buying stocks, you're buying it on a market. You're not going to Google or Facebook no. and saying, no. hey, can I have a you know, piece of your stock? No. So how does someone go about accessing the stock market, getting and starting an account so they can 
get involved in that? Sure. Well, I'm not on the retail side of the business. Uh, certainly, I'm educating students on the uh, financial markets. But the basic way is to open up a brokerage account. And there's several institu financial institutions that would be happy to do that for an individual. Once you open up that brokerage account, uh, you can start trading uh, on a stock. But certain particulars that they'll uh, work with you on before you set that up. Another opportunity to invest in stocks that I'd be remiss not bringing up is mutual funds. And that is a way, instead of owning one share of one company in a brokerage account, uh, you would invest in some mutual funds that are already highly diversified, and then they're managed by experienced investment professionals, subject matter experts in this field. Uh, and for some uh, folks, I do uh, suggest that because they might be, for instance, an engineer. So they're focused on their career and making an income, and they can't necessarily follow the, the stock market every day, um, or intraday, I should say. And so that might be a better alternative for them, is to focus on their career and their career development and um, put that in the hands of professionals. Because if you have you own pieces of more companies, you're spreading out that risk a little bit Correct. more. Correct. Right? If mm -hmm. one company, if you own pieces of 100 companies and one goes under, yeah. you're still doing okay because you have 99 others that are Correct. doing okay. Correct. So it's the, the, rule of, the golden rule of diversification, right? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, in a mutual fund, uh, most of them are very highly diversified, not concentrated. Whereas if you don't have a lot of money to go around and you're investing in only a couple companies, buying just a few shares, then that's considered a concentrated portfolio. And you might be better suited in a mutual fund. And I know there's a lot of um, investment professionals that preach, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, you gotta beat the market, I wanna beat the market, but they say, just try to be the market. Correct. And that's a good way to mm -hmm. do it, is to yeah. buy some of those mutual funds, ETFs, mm -hmm. or indexes Correct. that are basically just following what the stock market is doing. Yeah, and part of the challenge is just being in the market, right? And so if you're uncomfortable making those individual stock decisions, and you don't have the time, you're focused on your career or other things, um, I would say starting out with an ETF, an index fund is an absolutely great idea. And during the pandemic, we saw a, a lot of interesting perspectives on the stock market. Mm -hmm. We saw some of those unique um, speculative stocks uh, where people were actually trying to go against the hedge funds and try <laughs> to prop them up. And, yeah. and um, you know, people that had never invested in the stock market before mm -hmm. were now making millions of dollars by doing you know, these very speculative, risky investments, which I think that's always going to be part of it. And people, a lot of people associate stock market with gambling, mm -hmm. that it's almost like going to a casino. But in some ways, yes, it is if you're approaching it that way. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, you can focus it on as an investment where I'm going to have a long term goal for this and I'm going to really research and, and take some of the risk off of it. That's, some, that's another way that a lot of people should approach it as. I would absolutely say a long-term horizon investing in stocks is truly important. You don't want to be pulled into the emotion and some of those things you just referenced, there was a lot of that and folks thought maybe they could be a day trader instead of their real job. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, I would say there's companies out there that can draw a lot of attention on a short-term basis, and there might be some short-term gains, but I would really look for those companies that have um, a story you understand, keeping it simple again, uh, a large moat or protection around their business, so the barriers of entry are quite difficult, uh, and something that's sustainable for the long term. And if you, if you invest in companies like that, uh, chances are you're gonna be very pleased in a five, 10 year horizon. You know, one of the most uh, famous investors out there, Warren Buffett, invests yes, in the, he always says, that's the invest in things I can understand. I know he was a big believer in Coca-Cola and oh, correct. you know candy companies, food, because it's like he understands what it is. And that's an interesting way. You don't need to necessarily get that basic, but that's a great way to think about it is only by companies, mm -hmm. you know what they sell and mm -hmm. you, you can measure their success. You understand why they're successful. And he's, you know, the classic, probably one of the most successful investors um, in, in our country. And uh, he has st stayed true to that principle. And, and it's I don't think anyone can argue <laughs> his track record or success. Um, he's also looked at what I would say some macroeconomic 
um, areas of investing, which can also be successful. I mean, un making sure you still understand the company. But is there something um, in, in the economy right now or in the market that's going to be a disruption or is, uh, could be an opportunity in the future? And he's been very good at that. But again, he, you know, he's kind of a subject matter expert in the field. He yeah. does it for a living. A lot of people will think of New York City. That's mm -hmm. you know where the New York Stock Exchange. But there are other exchanges out there. And um, a lot of times we focus on American companies and American stocks. But a lot of portfolio managers recommend that you do get some exposure to other mm -hmm. countries and Correct. other other exchanges. If we could talk about how, you know, there are. It's a worldwide. Um, opportunities out there. So many mm -hmm. other countries, so many other companies you Correct. can invest in as well. Correct. Um, in my investment course that I teach at the University of St. Thomas, we explore uh, the emerging market equities uh, area. Uh, just investing overseas and what that does for the portfolio and what it does do in in really simple straightforward terms is it reduces your risk because you're broadening your exposure think about the, the what I said earlier it's all about diversification and so some of these emerging economies are just building out their infrastructure and there's a lot more growth and upside in some of those markets than here right in the United States so I always tell folks to make sure they look uh, what would you say, beyond the borders of the United States to mm -hmm. invest. Uh, and again, those uh, diversified pooled vehicles uh, in ETFs and in indexes and in mutual funds is, is really a nice way to go there. So summing everything up, I guess, what would you say are like maybe three good bullet points for people that are thinking about stocks for the first time, um, thinking about investing? What are some things they should um, think about and, and focus on if they want to get started? Uh, I guess the first thing I'd say is start small, get comfortable. So uh, take a look at maybe an industry um, or a company uh, that you've been following and have been in intrigued with. Because I think if you're passionate about something, that's literally the first good sign. Um, and then do some homework. Uh, it's no different than college or high school. Just uh, do some homework. Roll up your sleeves and spend the time getting comfortable with what does this company represent? What do they do? How do they make their money? And you can find a lot of that now online with their annual report uh, and their 10K. And again, as a, f a publicly traded company, they are you know, under regulation by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. They have to provide that information. So start there. And then keep it simple. If you can understand, again, um, that company's um, dynamics and value proposition to how they make money, then that's a huge start. And then um, either open up a brokerage account. Again, start small with things you understand and you're comfortable with and maybe products and services that you're passionate about. And it doesn't have to be just in technology because that's the real buzz right now. Mm -hmm. And then if you're uncomfortable doing individual stacks, then I would say uh, go the route of an index fund with broad market exposure that we've already talked about um, versus individual you know, shares of a company. And even though, and a good rule is, only invest enough money that you're willing to lose. Correct. <laughs> the stock market, you can lose money. And you can lose all of your money because in a bankruptcy situation or a reorganization, the dollars go first to the lenders um, and then the bondholders. Because if you're a bondholder, a good example would be if you're a bondholder of a company, you know, you pick any public company, um, they get paid back first before equity holders. So you might get pennies on the dollar, but you are taking a lot of risk because you're taking capital to own a piece of that company. And again, diversification is the way to minimize your risk. Correct, correct. It's <laughs> a good, uh, good lesson to leave on, <laughs> to yes. end on. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and giving us a good crash course in the stock market. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Have you ever heard of the Magnificent Seven? No, not the movie with cowboys. I'm talking about seven of the biggest tech stocks in the S&P 500. The club includes Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Meta, Nvidia, and Tesla. In our digital era, these companies are at the forefront of AI, electric vehicles, cloud computing, and other digital services. Because these companies are so influential, if they start to lose money, they can have a big impact on the market. Some indexes and funds put more money into these seven stocks than you might think. So if you're trying to diversify your portfolio, take a deeper look at these indexes to see how much money they invest in the Magnificent Seven. Just something to keep in mind if you really want to spread out your money.
Federal Reserve is done hiking interest rates, at least for now, the nation's central bank keeping its key rate unchanged. That's right. I can't talk about the stock market without mentioning the Federal Reserve. In the financial world, these two are closely intertwined. The Fed is not technically a part of the federal government. The Federal Reserve System is actually made up of 12 regional reserve banks. When it cuts interest rates, the stock market usually goes up. And when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, the stock market usually goes down. But there's no guarantees about how the market will react. The Fed weighs in on interest rates eight times a year. So keep an eye out when moving your money around. I also wanted to share an interesting investing tool that's available online from CNN Business, the Fear and Greed Index. Money is an emotional topic, and this tool is intended to give you another look at the markets. This index is based on the logic that excessive fear tends to drive down share prices, while too much greed can have the opposite effect. So if you're thinking about buying or selling, this can be another tool in your toolbox to help you cut through all of the noise. I've thrown a lot of information at you today. Wouldn't this be easier if you had just started learning about the stock market as a kid? Well, one Georgia school thought so. Now these elementary students are playing a game that will help them build a better future. This is really what you want to look at. Buy 84%. That's how you really want to buy your stocks and know it's really good. Fourth grader Kason Hawkins is one of the many students at John R. Lewis Elementary School who enjoys learning about the stock market. Like, it's fun and doing something positive is staying out of trouble. Students enter their info in the stock market game website. Once they put in their stocks on the stock market game, they say they watch it for a week and see how the stocks go up and down. They have a chance to go in and change which stocks they want so they can buy and sell just like if they were really doing it. Keisha Fleming teaches at the school and advises the program. She says students who opt into the experience not only enjoy it, but end up growing, just like some of the stocks they watch. So when they first started, they just started buying anything and everything. But as we progressed, they looked at, okay, this stock did good today, but let's look at what they did for three months. They progressed a lot. This spring, one of John R. Lewis's more than 15 stock market group teams won the end of spring stock market games. It's a district-wide competition. As we played more and more, we had ranked up and got to first place. Hawkins dreams of becoming a business owner and says learning how to use the stock market could help him achieve it. I can use money that I made from stocks to help my business. The stock market game is available online if you or a young person in your life wants to check it out. The stock market is tough to understand. The best advice I can offer, do your research and start small. In my own investing journey, I have lost everything that I put into a stock and I've tripled my money in just a few short months. There are highs and lows, so be prepared to see your money go up and down and never invest more money than you can afford to lose. Take care of your family and your finances before you put money into the market. Well, that's all for today's show. I'm your host, Gordon Severson, helping you save, spend, and invest your money wisely. I'll see you next time.